All right. For the sake of video, they've asked me to use a mic. I've got one of the voices, I really don't need a mic, so I'm not used to using a mic, so bear with me. Anyway, we're going to get started since I guess things aren't really delayed, it seemed that way. Um, my name is Doug Lenz. The topic I'll be talking about and hopefully sharing and getting your input on as well to make it a little more fun is, is design a commodity, okay? It's something that as designers we're probably all near and dear to our hearts and we worry about <clears throat> and certainly think about. Um, just to let you know my cone of vision in perspective terms, if you know what anything about perspective drawing, cone of vision is that part where you can see your hands just about as far as you can see, okay? So my cone of vision is I'm a product designer, physical product designer, not UI or UX, um, which is stealing our name. But uh, <laughs> we, so I've spent almost 40 years of my career doing that. I've, uh, I'll get into a little bit more of my history later on, but let's get started. Is design a commodity? <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Why isn't this working? Oh, there we go. Too much. <laughs> well, we're going the wrong way. Sorry about this. We're going to see the whole thing. Yes. Uh, so how was that? You're back on schedule. <laughs> All right. So we'll do one at a time. I don't know why the arrow's not. There we go. The arrow's working now. So the definition, obviously, with the Ukraine war, we're very sensitive to what commodities are. You know, gas went through the roof because of different circumstances. That's not what we're going to talk about here, obviously. We're talking about a goods or service <clears throat> that are widely available, uh, but may lead to smaller profits and margins, as diminishing the importance of factors such as brand and other things in price. Basically, how much can we charge for our goods and service, okay? Uh, simplest terms, what is design, okay? We're, we solve problems, and granted, my cone of vision is uh, applied art versus just fine art, but even fine art, you know, embraces solving a problem that wasn't there, or creating a problem, or a solution to something that no one even knew they needed, you know? But it's evoking emotion, okay? And I think whether it's a product that we see, packaging, anytime we apply art in any form, you're, you're applying some sort of emotion to it to get a reaction, to, to have people lean your way, okay? Why you are hired, okay? Basically, we're hired as designers because we think outside of their box, okay? It's not necessarily, and, and may, in fine art, it is our box, but in applied arts, it's more their box. We make money for them, you know? We create a product for them. We take whatever vision they have and turn it into reality, okay? So that's more or less where I'm, I'm heading with all this. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens in terms of service and why are we even talking about design possibly being a commodity, okay? Well, sometimes designers prepackage things. Oh, you want a logo? That's 750 bucks. What? You know, it should be based on the value for that company as well as the value of you and your giving it and your experience and a bunch of other things, okay? Package deals. Hey, you do this, I'll do that. So what happens is we de devalue. I have a former business partner who absolutely hated the designer test, okay? I'm interested in hiring you, but I'm going to test you first. Now on LinkedIn, they'll say, well, let's test your Adobe skills and all of that. In other words, let me, 
you know, jump through fire and hoops. Isn't the fact that you're a designer with experience enough? You know, think about a lawyer. Do they test lawyers? What was your bar exam, you know, at the end of the day? Were you an 86 or a 96% on the bar? Because I don't want you if you're below 90, you know? No one ever asks them that. So, you know, I think as designers, we can make ourselves a commodity by how we value our, our work and our efforts, okay? History of a theory, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little bit more about my background and where this word commodity started, I started using it in my career. Obviously, looking around, I'm the oldest guy here by, you know, two of you. <laughs> So I've been doing this, like I said, for almost 40 years. The first 16 years of my career, I was in-house for such companies as Coleco, PlaySchool, Hasbro, Jerry Baby Products, Samsonite, Low Pro, Monarch Luggage, Schwinn, and Fisher Price. Now you're like, well, those sound like pretty fun companies. And they were, they really were. The movie Big came out when I was designing toys. And if anyone who's seen the movie Big, it's an old one, Tom Hanks. Anyway, there's a couple of scenes in there that was very, very true to the toy industry. One of those scenes was the R&D guy with the remote control car. He's driving it and it runs into a bunch of suits and he backs the car up and you know sort of runs off into the corner. The R&D guys, we had total fun. We would go in. We had a VP at Coleco that said, put plastic over everything, we're gonna have a four hour squirt gun fight in the office. And, and we did, you know? And Coleco, there was a big ramp to the showroom where, you know, buyers from Toys R Us or Target or, you know, everywhere in the world would come and, and look at Coleco's line. Anyway, Coleco was the one that did those blow molded ride-ons, okay? So we would actually get on those things, run down the ramp, scaring everyone along the way. So being a toy designer was pretty much the way you could imagine. It was, it was fun, but it was very pigeon-toed. And in my career, I have fought that. You know, that, hey, you're, you're a toy designer. I remember when I was looking to get out of toy design, um, <clears throat> I sent NCR my resume, and they're like, send back a note saying, yeah, but you're a toy designer. And, and what do you know about electronics? Coleco, of course, had ColecoVision and, you know, all the electronic games. So I knew quite a bit, but their perception was all I could do was design toys. So I wrote them back and I said, yeah, I could take one piece of plastic and make it do 10 things versus you take 10 pieces of plastic just to house a piece of electronic. Who wins, okay? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so you can see it took me a while to get out of toy design. Jerry Baby Products was juvenile products, that's the furthest away I could get from toy design, okay? <clears throat> Fisher Price actually went back to, they were a toy company, but I was doing juvenile products for them. Since then, I've been on my own, uh, <clears throat> designed, since I got into Schwinn, bikes have always been a passion of mine. I, I know I don't look like a stealthy racer, but at one point in my life, I, I was pretty fast. Anyway, so bikes, I've designed for tons more bike companies that didn't even are on there. But, um, and, and outdoor equipment, I've had a great life designing products. You know, toys that I wanted to use, okay? <clears throat> In addition to that, I've taught at the Art Institute and Metropolitan University. Uh, if you look up alpinebluehome.com, you'll see it's a furniture company, all local Colorado wood, so a lot of beetle kill. Um, and just very fun Colorado style furniture, you know, and so I own that as well uh, with my wife. <clears throat> uh, this past year, I have not been awarded any design awards in my life, so I gotta get almost 40 years of the business to have that happen. Uh, designed what a red dot award, anyone know what that is? Right now it's probably one of the more prestigious design awards. Core 77, we were runner-up on transportation design. So it's, you know, go figure, right? <laughs> anyway, um, who here remembers 9-11? I mean, we all should, right? Well, 9-11 to me 
before it became 9-11 that we all remember was actually the bankruptcy court date for Schwinn. The people that bought Schwinn also bought GT bikes, paid way too much for GT bikes, GT sales went like this, so they bankrupt both of us, okay? Schwinn at the time was growing at 20% a year. The fitness division was growing about 35% a year. We were doing great, but we were, you know, anchored by a different company. <clears throat> so I wake up thinking, oh, great, today I'm going to know who's going to own us and whether or not I have a job, you know. It was the, literally the court date of uh, our bankruptcy. Obviously, courts were closed, Every, you know, so we had to wait a little longer. Ten days after 9-11, I get invited to the office, the new owners, you know. <clears throat> so, while I was making my case, I came up with the word commodity. And here's how I used it, and here's the foundation of, of what we're going to be talking about, a lot of it. One, you're looking at two different toasters here. $10, $33, right? 33 yeah essentially. If you buy either toaster, you take it home, and what happens? You put toast in it, browns it. If it doesn't, what happens? You take it back, right? I would. I want my $10. I don't care what it costs. I, I want that money back. Or I want something that does toast, because that's why I bought a toaster. So I figured out at this point that engineering is basically a commodity. Okay, that no matter what you buy, you buy it with the expectation it's going to work. Okay, so then it becomes, all right, in the physical world, not necessarily art, we look at why are you choosing this over that? You know, back in the day, everything was on shelves. Now you go to Amazon and you got pages and pages of toasters. Who, who you know, how do you decide, right? Well, how you decide is design. And that's what it, so no matter what you buy, it's either going to work or you take it back. That's a commodity in my mind, okay? What makes you buy it or drives you to buy it becomes more than a commodity. <clears throat> so, again, is design a commodity? In doing research for this, I start to worry that some design disciplines are heading that way, even in mine. And I'll, I'll show you an example of uh, some AI technology that's really cool, but it's sort of flawed, okay? So the first thing, graphic design. You can go to any one of these graphic websites, plug in your name, and they'll spit out a logo. Plug in your, you know, look through pages and pages of menus that you want to have yours emulate. And so all of a sudden, design becomes very, very easy. And, you know, it, it is still elevated. It's not like the simplest of terms. But in many ways, it is, is becoming commoditized. And I don't want to say that lightly. But by having everything so easily accessible, maybe it is. So, so food for thought. Once again, I design physical products you can pick up and you touch. There's something called generative design in the 3D world of CAD where a CAD operator can program in different properties. I need this to be so strong in this force, in this way, and, and how are you going to handle that, okay? Simple, sort of cool. I, I have a theory that if all, everything was designed to look like this, in a couple of years, you'd go, oh, yeah, you know? <laughs> so it, it would need to evolve, too. But so what could happen? What's wrong with that, right? Let me show you. <clears throat> Who here knows what this product is, what you're looking at? Say it out loud. OK, it's a bike frame. But if you were to try to ride this bike frame, you'd very be very dissatisfied with the performance of it. It's thick where it needs to be thin. It's thin where it needs to be thick. So it's going to be this boat anchor of a bike. You know, let's call it what it is. So why did the computer generate this? 
Okay. Well, the engineer, and believe it or not, in talking with a lot of non-bike engineers, they always think of bikes as the forces in a bike are linear. Okay. I'm hitting something, so that force is coming through the wheel back at me. I'm pushing down on the pedals. I'm sitting on a seat. So all the forces are in one plane. It's a 2D force, right? If you've ever gone mountain biking especially, you know that's far from the truth. The forces are actually in 3D. I call it a 3D sphere. Because when you crank down on a pedal, you're actually pushing that whole bottom bracket to one side, and then you push it the other way. And then as you're going around the curve, that seat's pushing the bike in another direction. Being a tiny guy that I am, <clears throat> I've done numerous times what's called tacoing a front wheel. That's where literally the front wheel just folds. It makes it look more like a potato chip, okay? Last time I broke four ribs. <clears throat> Anyway, why is that? If it's all linear, that wheel would be straight as can be. Well, as soon as you start to turn, all those forces are pushing against that wheel in a very unfriendly way, okay? And you put someone big like me on a wheel that's rated for, let's say, a 170-pound person. I don't know who would do, ever do that. The wheel's going to fold on you eventually, and it did, <clears throat> okay? So once again, when we talk about AI, and, and if any of you are here from the previous uh, talk, the, the question was about AI and art. And the answer was, that the gentleman gave was very perceptive, that he, ho you know, he hopes that the operator will elevate what AI can do. And if you think about this as being 3D generative computer design, the limitations are the operator, not necessarily the computer. So the human element is still going to have its fingerprint on this stuff for a while. I mean, we hope for a long while, but, you know, we don't know how long that's going to be. Okay? So when we're talking about <clears throat> design, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years. Each year, design's being elevated. You know, industrial design, my industrial design, not UI, UX, has been around since the 1920s, 1930s. It's been around before, but not really formally. You know, you look at Egyptian chairs. They're actually pretty cool, some of them. So 2,000, 3,000 years ago, people were thinking about design and things of that nature, but as a formal profession, okay? Each year, it just elevates. I'm going to use this, uh, uh, these two elements of the gloves two more times, and you'll see why later. <clears throat> What's happening now, too, is consumers are very savvy. About 10, well, 15, 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, companies became very savvy into looking at the demographics of people to understand what you wanted. Now there, it's becoming even more individualized to understanding that. But we as consumers, we have the ability to start really analyzing and seeing products in a different light too and far more than we ever have before. One of the first trade shows, this was a while ago, that I ever went to was the Housewares trade show. I was designing coolers for Arctic Zone, which they were the first to do soft-sided coolers they, um, they were the 90-pound gorilla in that category. But I was surprised when I went to the houseware show, there was probably 30 other companies with soft-sided coolers. You as a consumer, you and I, we may see one or two brands in that space, but in reality, there's just a ton of people in that space. So one thing that Amazon has done is opened our eyes up to all these other people in that space. You know, and you're like, oh my God, why is there so many more products here than it? Well, that's why, okay? It's pretty crazy. <clears throat> but as a, a savvy consumer, <clears throat> you know, how many of us re read reviews, product reviews? Now, of course, if you're like me, I, I'll read the good ones because I want to hear 
what people like about the product I'm going to spend money on, but I also want to see the, na the absolute worst ones. What's failing with this product? Why aren't they happy? You know, and a lot of times it has nothing to do with the product. Oh, customer service was bad, or this or that. And so you're like, all right, this must be a decent product. I'll, I'll invest in it, okay? So anyway, so another thing that's driving design to be commodity is competition. I put foreign competition in my space. There are factories offering free design. If you went over to the Far East, they have these showrooms as big or bigger than this room full of products that they make and that you and I as consumers never see because it's maybe they designed it for Europe or something. So you as a product manager go, you know, I like that, but that crazy, you know, color I don't like, so let's make it this and bring it to the U.S., okay? No designer ever touches it from our point of view. So that what does that do? Once again, lowers the bar of where design might meet commodity, okay? Creativity. <clears throat> this is where I think we cross the line to what design brings to the party. So what is creativity? I'm going to read it. I hate to do that. Well, actually, I'm not. Just read it. Pay attention to the red ones, okay? When you're done, just, you know, okay. So, <clears throat> innovative, original, new, imagine a skill, artistic. All those are non-commodity words. You can't box those up and somehow package them and say, oh, that's a commodity field, okay? So organically, design is non-commodity by its very nature, okay? <clears throat> Every now and then I like to throw quotes, so they'll be in green. There's only two of them. Design is respected, <coughs> disrespected, and unfunded is treated like a commodity rather than a critical asset. Part of the problem with whether it's fine art or applied art is having the people with the money understand the value, okay? What we are in the product side, we've fr pr finally reached a, a, a point in time where companies go, yeah, I need design. I need to differentiate myself. I need to have that sensitivity of you know, user ability of this. So does industrial design has, has reached that point of maturity, that people understand it. Now, like all things that we have to pay for, sort of like taxes, we kick and scrape and, you know, scream every time we have to pay for it. Corporations are that way too. I've only met a few where they're like, yeah, give me more of that. And then they're throwing money my way. There has been a few. So... <clears throat> So hopefully, with that understanding of what creativity is, uh, we can look at what hopefully design brings to the party, okay? Perceived value, okay? If you remember the first time I showed this image, one of these gloves was like 16 bucks, the other was like 40 something bucks. And you're like, well, they're both sort of cool, they're both good brands, so what, okay? If you look at the inside of the glove, you start realizing what they bring to the party. There's value there. There's extra padding. There's, you know, points where it's bending a different way, where the other gloves just exist. You know, put, put it on your hand. It's offering some sort of protection, but not much. Okay? Perceived difference. So those could have been the same. I just broke them up because I do think there is a bit of a difference there. So once again, same thing, same points. Emotional. These dumbbells, you can select what weight you want. So my wife and I can use the same dumbbell set. She does more weight than I do, but you know, it's okay. Um, but they're obviously, uh, these dumbbell sets, believe it or not, retail for the same amount. One looks incredibly simple and clean, the other one looks more like, yeah, I'm gonna beef up and use these, you know? So there's an emotional direction you might go when you see these, okay? 
And that's part of what design brings to the equation is this emotion. Obviously, design and art, we can't separate each other. We're, you know, it's the same coin. So this is a air humidifier, I think, or something like that. Pretty cool. We had one. It didn't work well, though. So it's, uh, it's that engineering thing. <laughs> All right. Then there's the connection with the product, where it's aspirational. It's, it's our emotion. It's kicking something within inside of us. And I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to be on a Jeep in the woods in the snow? I mean, goodness. But you know, we see it on the internet. We, we do all these things. It's that, that intangible that hits us sort of like the emotion, but even at a different level. All right. The attempt to alleviate risk actually backfires, stifling innovation and leaving a company more at risk for irrelevance. What we're seeing now, at least I'm seeing it, <laughs> is companies are worried about a recession right now. So what are they doing? I'm going to cut my R&D budgets, OK? I've seen this since the first Gulf War, where basically you know, something happens external, and they're going to say, oh, let's, let's cut R&D budgets. We're going to increase our sales by cutting R&D budgets. Now, there's a few savvy companies out there that go, now's the time I'm going to shift whatever free money I have and invest in R&D. And guess what happens? They steal market share. Because while the other companies are going to be limping along with the same product next year and the year after that, the companies that invest during a downtime actually win. Okay? And I, once again, 40 years of doing this, I've seen it. All right. So now we're talking about investments, money, you know, the holy grail. ROI. So what is it going to cost me? My return on investment. As far as I know, everything I've read and experienced up today, there is no good matrix for evaluating what we as designers bring to the table. It's not a dollars to dollars sense. So while we can talk about ROI, <clears throat> return on investment, it doesn't it doesn't hold water. One, if you really think about bringing a product to market, there are so many people in that chain to make that happen. You know, just, in, in, once again, Kona Vision is product design. In my Kona Vision, so we have product engineers, and then you have product uh, manufacturing engineers, and then there's packaging engineers. So just to get a product, there's three or four or electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. There's all these engineers lined up that can make or break a product just as well as I can as design. Then there's marketing people, product managers, legal. You know, you saw my, the, the first page where you saw in-house what companies I worked for. Fisher Price was a great company and I, I praise them every time I get. Every product in their schedule, which could be hundreds, once a month goes before the legal committee, and the legal committee tears it apart, saying, have you looked at this, this pinch point? Have you saw this? Why is that? Because they have that experience. Now, we need to, as designers, take that and realize they're saying it out of concern, and we should do that. I actually had, when I was at play school, the number one grossing or number one unit sales product was these little busy squares. They basically sold a million per SKU. There was three different SKUs, so three million units of these little things. Canada actually filmed, the Canadian Safety Committee filmed a kid, and what it was was a little busy box that could fit on a bag, you know, mom's purse or diaper bag or something. And so it had a little ring that would attach. Well, Canada filmed a kid picking it up by the ring and smacking another kid. <laughs> Clear misuse, but they voted it the worst product of the year. 
you know, and you're like, how does that happen, you know? But, you know, reality is that, that people do misuse things. And, you know, I, I had that distinction of having the worst Canadian toy product out for one year, you know. Thank God there's always something new. All right. In simplest terms, what is profit, okay? And the reason why we talk about this as designers is because the more profit we make our company, the happier they are with me, okay? The more we understand where they're coming from, the more they're likely to hire us for a job or something like that. So basically, there's two ways to generate more profit. One is revenue, increasing the the number of customers or increasing the value of those customers, okay? What do I mean by that? You can sell one apple for a million dollars or a million apples for a dollar. That's what I mean. So that's that balance of what you're seeing over there, okay? Cost, <clears throat> decreasing fixed costs. I have a furniture company. <clears throat> I'm not fortunate enough to have 80 acres of land and you know, have a big barn to build furniture in. I've got to rent space. Well, that's fixed costs. The fixed costs of the website, the domain name, all that is fixed costs. The, what is a variable cost would be the insurance that I have to cover. So that, you know, if someone were to start weight training with a walnut table that weighs 350 pounds and it falls on them, crushes their leg, I've got insurance to cover me for that, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, we have those fixed costs and decreasing variable costs, okay? All those will lead to greater profits in the simplest of forms. So, how does this relate to design? So, I've sort of let it leak. New product or, you know, becomes a new category, all right? We can create new products, we could create new categories, or we elevate and have a higher ASP. ASP meaning average sale price. So once again, all of a sudden our apples are a million each. Hey, hey, <laughs> you know, we're in the bank. But would we sell any? So, you know, everything has to make sense. All right, once again, <clears throat> in a budget, if we can make things and we come within budget, then we've achieved our fixed cost for that. Okay, whether it's tooling dollars, you know, every bi business, they have a spreadsheet and they allow X amount for R&D. In R&D would be tooling costs, cost of the designers, uh, packaging, all that stuff spilled out year to year. And if we can come in and come in and, and budget, then we've hit our fixed cost or come in below, then we've exceeded that. So... Variable costs would be, some of those line items are variable, but if we can find cheaper insurance or when we tool up something, it actually costs less. That does happen. Or instead of having two or three changes to it that we were planning for, it just was done. It's good. We're ready to roll. So that's all good. Okay? So once again, I said earlier, there's really no way to understand return on investment when it comes to design. There are ways we can go to sort of get us there and benchmarking current product versus new is one of them. So I'm replacing, you know, this car seat for a kid with a new car seat and oh my, my dollar, you know, my unit sales went up and my SP went up. Well, that's a good benchmark, but it doesn't really cover your total cost and all the sales guys that were maybe pushing it or the fact that the competition fell down, had two major recalls and five deaths and all of a sudden you're the only guy making car seats for kids. You know, all this is a variable to, to true cost and return on investment when it comes to design, okay? But we can start measuring, but really getting your arms around that fully to the point where accountants gonna be satisfied, it gonna happen. So, <clears throat> how do we value companies? <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was teaching uh, a design class and I had a sponsor 
from a patent lawyer. And the guy, he's, we should all be patent lawyers. He charges 850 an hour, and this was back then. Patent lawyers of all lawyers are the highest paid, believe it or not. Anyway, he was the first one who enlightened me about what's going on with the values of companies. Once again, you know, I've been doing this for decades, and when I first started, you know, companies had their own factories here, and they had land, and they had all this tangible stuff. So the value of that company was what they were reinvesting in, as far as buying more equipment, injection molders, and you know, stuff like that, more land to build a bigger factory. And so the value of the company was based on fixed costs. Now it's based on IP. Why is Apple, you know, a trillion dollar company? It makes no sense based on what they own. Yeah, they, they spend a billion dollars plus a year on R&D, but that's trillion with a T, not billion, okay? So why is the value of that company so high? Well, it's their IP. It's their branding. It's the total collective experience of using an Apple has driven that company up to the value that it is, okay? So, the fun part. <clears throat> we as designers need to position ourselves as experts. When we belittle ourselves, oh, I'll do that free test for you, you know, that diminishes our value. It makes us more a commodity. Even though, by very nature of creativity, we're never going to be a commodity, okay? Or we shouldn't be, if, unless we allow it, okay? Show clients that design is an investment, not an expense, okay? If you talk to them about real life experiences, I've got a ton of them where I could say, hey, the company was expecting to do 60,000 units, and it ended up doing 360,000 units. Wouldn't everyone want a surprise like that? And I can't guarantee that, because there's so many variables. You know, we can't guarantee that an investment in the design equals uh, a 6x, 7x return on that investment. But it's an investment. It's not an expense. Okay? So... <clears throat> commodity, expected versus unexpected, all right? That's how I started off. Remember, you buy that $10 toaster, you expect it to work. You buy a $30,000 car, you expect it to work. You buy a $80,000 car, I expect it to do even more than work, you know? Cadillac had a wonderful ad. It says, when you turn your car on, does it return the favor? And, and, and so, naturally, a $10 toaster is not going to return that favor. But, you know, I think that's where our goal is. You know, I, I often tell a story. I grew up in Ohio, near Dayton, Ohio, south of that, out in the sticks, okay? Whenever I went camping, it rained. Not only did it rain, I got mosquito bites, like, you know, 89, 90, 90, you know, you would count them and it would be in the 90s, okay? Then I would get poison ivy. So after about eight times camping, what do you think my attitude toward camping was? Hell no, no thank you, you know? I remember going once in the wintertime going, no mosquito bites, yay, no fire, fucking cold. <laughs> so, you know, but, what happens? Fast forward. I'm living in Colorado, beautiful wife, beautiful house, just had a kid, going, you know what, 310 days of sunshine, I need to get a, some sort of tent for this kid to put him in the backyard and not have him be a lobster, okay? So went to Costco, looking around, they had the kids' tents, and all of a sudden there's this $59 kilty tent. So I'm like, yeah, I'll buy the kilty tent. So I'm get it home, and I start putting it up. Now, granted, I was 12 years old, probably the last time I camped, and I was 32, so 20 years had passed. Tent technology changed. Let's just put it that way. When I started putting the tent together, I couldn't wait to go camping. 
And I'm like, what the heck? What is this? You know? And I, that to me is the ultimate in what a good product is or a good you know, experience with design is when it takes something you almost oppose and turns you 180 degrees, then you know you got a winner, okay? Just to show you some things that are unexpected that we've worked on, and this is by no way I mean by self-promotion as much as just some fun things that we've done. We were in a competition. Airstream actually put out a bid, and uh, we were in a competition with six other firms to win their business. Okay, I knew right away that if we just redesigned the Airstream, it'd be like, so what? Everyone else was going to do that. It just so happens between May and September when this thing was, we were working on this thing, I saw three different Airstreams tipped over alongside the road. And you're like, what gives? You'd think it's a more aerodynamic camper than a lot of them, right? So <clears throat> we're like, well, let's, let's take this to the next level. So we started looking at ways to move blue water and black water. We looked at ways of moving the, the wheelbase so it could handle more like a sports car or handle more like a semi in the sense of just, you know, wants to go straight. But if you're parking, move the wheels up toward the car, makes it park much more sharply. Um, we controlled everything about the Airstream, the air conditioning, heating, window shades, everything, by <clears throat> the app. And guess what? We won, okay? So we fly out to Airstream, and they're happy to see us and say, hey, you won the competition. We're like, hey, that's great. While we're sitting there, the seat goes, well, how big are you? And I said, well, there's five of us, okay? And he's looking at me, and he goes, okay. So then we go home and get a little note saying, thank you very much. You clearly did well beyond what we wanted, but we're going to go with the firm that has 140 people, you know, and so that's why we didn't get the business. But we did what was unexpected. We took an opportunity and really looked at changing the, the game of what camping is. To, to bring it up to today's technology, especially with Airstream. It's a camper that's been around since the 1930s. So, pretty cool. Uh, in case you can't understand what this is, it's a, it's a pet barrier for a car, okay? Every now and then, I actually submit ideas to, to different companies. This one was branded Thule, so we submitted it to Thule, saying you really should get, look at pet carriers, because you make all these wonderful products for for cars, why not a pet barrier? Interesting enough, they weren't interested in that, but they just started and launched a pet division that has nothing to do with cars. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't pretend to be the smartest guy in the room, so you know, at this point, I, I really don't. <clears throat> We've all seen rideshare scooters, right? This was a very wealthy startup where they wanted a, a ride, uh, you know, sit down scooter, not stand up one. And that's what this was about. And a little sketch, the end result, very fun. Uh, of course, if I got on it, I'd look like the bear on the tricycle in the circus. But, you know, ergonomically it worked for most people and uh, it's sort of fun. This product, again, was one of those we took to Yakima and uh, Thule had one that raised up and down. We're saying, hey, you know, the market, theirs and everybody else's takes a half an hour to get on. Why don't you make something that gets on and off in seconds? Basically, it's a key lock and it's off. Well, we designed it in 209, came out in like 218, 219. Can't make enough of them, okay? But it was a paradigm shift of what was going on. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's where we are. So, hey. Thank you for coming and listening. I'm here for any questions, if you'd like. And if you don't, that's, that's fine, too. <laughs> so I apologize. I was uh, stuck in um, <clears throat> the uh, traffic and the uh, rainstorm with an Uber. I wanted to introduce this guy because he is um, a hidden gem here in the Rocky Mountains. 
Um, as you can tell, he's an amazing and articulate uh, speaker. He's got a lot of great experience and wisdom. I hope you all took away with uh, some really good nuggets there. Um, but, uh, you know, he's also uh, incredibly approachable. And uh, I have owned two of the bikes that he's designed, and I've absolutely loved them. Um, and he can still, to this day, kick my ass riding. So, <clears throat> which, I don't know what to do about that, but maybe one day. Yeah, well, I'm getting older. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm getting older and slower, too. But anyway, I just want to thank you, Doug, for being here. Um, sorry I couldn't enter you, but, uh, you, you know, it's, it's just it's fantastic to have you. So thank you. All right, and uh, for, yes, and for those of you who are interested at the HQ, there's a uh, women empowering, uh, not a pitch, but sort of a networking event. Uh, so um, it's, we're, you know, feel free to head over there if you want. Otherwise, uh, tomorrow we have some great presentations here, and then there's at the HQ Amazon area, there's a, a keynote with Linda Gross. Uh, she just got in a couple hours ago from San Francisco, and it's gonna be an amazing presentation. Uh, on wayfinding as well as sustainability, and she has some amazing stories. Uh, she worked with Shenard, um, what's his name? Patagonia? Shenard. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, so anyway, and she's got all this wonderful experience, and she's going to instill some great wisdom. So thank you. Be well. Take care. <laughs>